welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're going to be spending a fascinating hour with our amazing panelists talking about two formative decades in TMCC's history. I'm Kate Kirkpatrick, Director of Marketing here at TMCC, and it is my pleasure to help present this panel, although I'm only going to say hello and then I'm going to let Cameron step in as our, as our moderator. So this is the second in a series of three of historical panels that we're presenting this year. If you didn't have a chance to watch the first one, it is available on YouTube. And the third one will cover our um, third, no, sorry, fourth and fifth decades. And we're just in the planning stages of that, haven't got a whole lot of details to share, but uh, please watch for that in the next six months. Our anniversary is wrapping up with commencement in May. And so we are doing our best to spread the celebration out throughout the year. So if you could do me a favor, please, and write your name in the chat box. Our professional development team has asked me to take attendance, and that is the easiest way to do that. So if you are here joining us live, please put your name in the chat box. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. And I'm going to let Cameron take it away. Cool. Thanks, Kate. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I think this is going to be a pretty interesting topic and we've got some great panelists that are going to give some first-hand accounts of what things were like during a period of tremendous growth for TMCC, the 80s and the 90s. Um, our panelists, we have uh, President Emeritus John Galtney, um, Emeritus Faculty Pat Slavin and Humberto Hernandez, and current political science faculty member Fred Lockett. Um, so to get us started, before we really jump into a lot of the changes that took place, I'd like to let each of our panelists introduce themselves and um, tell us when did they start here at TMCC and really what were some of their first impressions of the campus here? Um, so let's see, um, Dr. Galtney, could you start off for us? I think he's trying to get uh, something set up so that he can be heard. So I'm not sure he's quite ready yet. All right, Fred, how about you uh, kick it off, please? Oh, because I spoke up, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> sure. Well, hi, everyone. It really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, I've been at TMCC since the fall term of 1991. Uh, I was hired in in a class of 13. That was the largest group of faculty that had been hired at TMCC up till that time. Certainly we've exceeded that since then, but uh, it was uh, quite an amazing experience. I, I had not had any experience with community college. I'd been teaching, teaching university and I was coming from Wisconsin where we don't have a community college system. So I wasn't really sure what to anticipate, uh, much less uh, knowing that much coming from another, another region of the country, really didn't know Reno very well, didn't know TMCC very well. Uh, the interview was one of the most spectacular interviews I ever had in my life, and it let me know that I was coming to a very professional organization. That was exciting, and uh, it was it was new. Uh, when I came to campus for my interview, I I, I thought I'd made a wrong turn uh, driving into the sagebrush, but finally saw the roof of the Red Mountain building uh, emerging. Uh, back then, it didn't really have a name. And uh, it was uh, quite surprising uh, to find the you know, campus and parking lots in the uh, middle of what I thought was nowhere. So it was an interesting introduction to TMCC and, and uh, it was an adventure from that point forward. Thank you, Fred. Um, Pat? Well, I started in fall of 73. Uh, but I left the college in 1979. My husband took a job in the Bay Area. So I was gone for a while. When I came back to the college, which was about three years later, I really didn't find that many differences uh, that had taken place while I was gone. The college was still small. Jim Erdley was still the president. I um, was pretty familiar with the programs and services that we offered. So I felt really quite comfortable uh, nestling back into <laughs> to my home, uh, away from home. And uh, most of the faculty and staff were the same. So I knew most of them. I don't think things changed too much um, for me or that I noticed too much until we hired John Galtney as president. Welcome, John. 
and um, then things started happening, and I think happening fairly quickly, and those are the things that we'll be hearing about today. Uh, so look forward to that. Thank you, Pat. Um, Umberto. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here as uh, one of the panelists. I, I started uh, TMCC in the fall of 1987 as a computer lab monitor. Uh, and then um, there was an amnesty program that started in 1986. And there was a, a, a requirement for students to take, to do 30 hours of English as a second language classes uh, to, uh, as, a, as a path to become a, a US citizen. I, um, I was helping coordinate the ESL program uh, from 1988 till 1990 until I got hired by Pat and Kathy Odinsky in the community services at Old Time Mall, which was, which was a, a great experience from there. I, I continued doing workshops uh, with Pat and Kathy in the community services at Old Time Mall. And I did uh, English as a second language, uh, citizenship classes mainly. Uh, we served over 3000 students, uh, helped them become US citizens. I had great, uh, relationship with the uh, immigration service at the time. And they came into our classrooms and did all of their uh, tests and that it, uh, avoided them going into their offices. Uh, but that was a great experience. Um, then uh, in uh, 1997, I moved uh, over to uh, a work as a um, uh, computer uh, tester uh, for the uh, AccuPlacer and at, uh, at, uh, started at Alton Mall and then moved over to Edison. Um, my first impressions from TMCC back in when I started um, uh, as a student in 1984, uh, everyone was so welcoming. I, I felt uh, like I belonged uh, there, uh, the, 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 the people, the staff, I felt, I felt like at home. Uh, and that's the one thing I remembered uh, from TMCC. Then I, I continued working uh, in the financial aid uh, as a, a student uh, in charge of the student employment. Uh, and then uh, went into uh, uh, become an academic advisor uh, towards the end and I retired in 2016. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know if, Dr. Galtney is available um, yet, but um, I could kind of introduce him. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. So you, for those of you that don't know, you can see who I'm, um, who I'm talking about here. So that's Dr. Galtney right there. Um, he was selected as the next president of TMCC in April of 1986. Um, he was previously serving as president of Pratt Community College in Pratt, Kansas. Um, there were over 100 applicants for his uh, for the presidential position that year. Um, and then Dr. Galtney was eventually selected out of four finalists by the Board of Regents. Um, so and then he started his tenure here in um, uh, July of 1986. All right. So. Um, I'm going to kind of skip it, skip ahead a little bit. Um, we were going to talk about another topic, but I think Dr. Galtney um, would be better suited to speak on that. So Umberto spoke about a little bit um, about moving into Old Town Mall. Um, during the 1980s, that's when we really began to expand beyond the Dandini campus. Um, and really that's become a focal point of the college is having all of our satellite locations throughout Reno Sparks. Um, I'd like to ask you all, um, what were some of the impacts of that first move into Old Town Mall? And really, what was it like to be a part of that? Um, Umberto, could you start, please? As I said before, um, uh, Pat and Kathy Odinsky uh, were excellent bosses. I, I, I love them. I love working for them. Uh, and there was a huge, huge need, in, like I said, uh, for the amnesty program and also English as a second language. And we started those programs there at the old, well, continued the programs with at the Old Town Mall. And um, 
it was uh, it was a great experience because uh, we had a lot of uh, interest from the community to come in and take those uh, workshops and classes. Pat, you want to add to that? Sure. I I um, remember moving to Old Town Mall. At, at Business and Industry was the first group that started out there, and I think Veterans Upward Bound followed them. Um, and then Community Services was asked to move to Old Town Mall, and my first reaction was probably a little bit of, well, you know, we're kind of being banished away from the campus. Um, but in a short while, I think we all recognize that that's where we needed to be. We needed to be physically more central. You know, students coming to TMCC who um, are following an academic path need the services that are provided on the Dandini campus, such as counseling and admissions and records services and the controller's office. And, you know, they need to be a part of that community. Many of the programs that we ended up running at Old Town Mall were uh, for people, well, in community services, it was for people who wanted a woodworking class or, a, you know, a Chinese cooking class. And so they were not necessarily um, interested in having their transcript evaluated or going through any um, orientation process. They just wanted to sign up for the class. We, at one point, I remember counting in the 80s at some point, we had uh, in community services, we had very few classes on campus because yeah. those were reserved for the state supported classes. And right. when we yeah. okay. moved to, um, before we moved to Old Town, I remember counting the class locations that we had. And we had over 40 locations in town that we offered classes. Could have been, you know, the school district classrooms, could have been a private business a church basement, you know, we went anywhere someone would give us some space. And so we were, we were doing well with regards to classes, but for our students to be able to talk to somebody other than somebody in their class, having a location that was convenient, I think made a huge difference. You know, you go to Rayleigh's and then you walk upstairs and pick up a schedule of classes, ask questions about things. And it was a very comfortable situation where you didn't have to drive too far, find a parking spot, wend your way through several buildings. So all in all, I think it was a wonderful thing for community services. And I think it also was a good thing for TMCC in general, because I think we were pretty good recruiters for things other than community services. Veterans Upward Bound was there, and we know what a great success that was. Um, the Reentry Center was there. Um, so there were some unique audiences, some specific audiences that had some unique um, needs and wants. And I think by having a location that was that convenient, it made a huge, huge difference in how we progressed. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Fred, anything you'd like to add? That's just indicating that uh, Dr. Galtney can hear and see us. Just we are having trouble, I guess, hearing him. So uh, he is trying to work that out. I must admit, I was incredibly impressed when I did get uh, to TMCC. Uh, one of the realities with the 13 new hires is there was, was no office space on main campus. So although my entire teaching schedule was at the Dandini location, my faculty office was located at Old Town Mall, uh, as were the other colleagues. And uh, I actually really appreciated that. Uh, it was a very welcoming place. Pat made sure of that. Uh, I agree, there were a lot of, of TMCC services that had moved into this innovative idea of being more in the community by, uh, by literally uh, being present in the mall. That was a big thing going on at community colleges nationally at that time. Uh, Dr. Galtney was aware of that. And I, I think that you know, that was the style of his leadership to, to literally be far more contemporary in the way that TMCC was interacting in the community. There was also business and industry at that location and Mike Rainey 
And what I really was uh, so impressed with, uh, with Pat's operation was the sheer number of campus locations the community education program was working in. I think at the time there was this argument or, or, or the statement that uh, they were teaching classes in like 35 different locations across the valley, a very close relationship with the Washoe County School District at that point, and a lot of credit classes were being taught at uh, various high schools in the Valley. But many of our, our other classes were just in facilities. There was this great connection. There was a community that was so supporting TMCC as it grew. And our enrollments were reaching record levels uh, by the time I arrived in 1991. So uh, there was another building under construction at that point in time, the Vista building uh, that was desperately needed for space. Uh, and when that came online, that began to, to help. I actually was able to move my office up to, to main campus when that happened. And then when English and math moved over to the new Vista building. Uh, but it was just a level of amazement and excitement. And I agree that the Old Town Mall location just seemed to increase the visibility of the campus. If we could imagine Reno even 30 years ago, uh, nowhere near the, the size it is today, the, the Dandini location albeit free land, was not exactly at the heart and center of the community. And it was the, the Old Town Mall location that literally, I think, brought the campus much closer to the community. As, as Pat said, it became a stop-in point for anyone interested in taking any kind of classes at TMCC. And the early programs that I knew at that point in time, the, the nursing program was already very impressive under Bernice, Bernice Martin Matthews. We had programs that were you know, clearly being recognized. We were being very integrated into the community as, as a provider of, of the skills and talents that the, that the growing economy and the changing economy in, in Reno needed. So all of that was present on main campus and all of that was very much present down at Old Town Mall. Thank you, Fred. I think you nailed it there. Um, you, know, you had a great point um, that you brought up about the Vista building. And that's going to lead us into our one of our next topics. Um, beginning in the early 90s, the Dandini campus saw an incredible amount of growth in construction in a very short time. Um, 1990, 91, uh, the Vista building and the child care center um, came under construction and then were completed. The advanced technology center, which is now the Sierra building, um, was completed in 1997. Shortly before that, the Elizabeth Sturm Library, uh, the new standalone building was completed. Um, so I'd like to ask all of you, um, during that time, what was it like to have so much construction happening in a consecutive period for years and years? Um, and then what was the impact you think it had on uh, faculty, staff, and students? Um, Pat, could you start, please? Well, you know, it's interesting um, because I don't remember it being as disruptive as you might think with all of the construction right on Dandini. Um, however, I'm sure that it did impact us because I, you know, parking is always an issue. And if you've got um, big tractors and bulldozers and cranes or whatever equipment you have under construction, taking up a large portion of your campus site I'm sure parking was impacted. I don't recall it being, um, you know, I don't recall the noises or, you know, the uh, anything that was really a distraction from our day-to-day -day routines. I don't know, maybe we just got used to it because it was frequent and ongoing in many cases. Umberto, anything you'd like to to add about that? Uh, you know, as, as Pat said, um, all the noises, I, I've never, I don't remember ever being disrupted by any of the noises or the cranes or the bulldozers going around. Um, it, it was, it, it was a, it was necessary for, for TMCC to grow as fast as we did in the 90s because of the need of the community for the services that we offered. And then of course, Reno kept growing and growing. And yes, we had to use a lot of satellite uh, buildings to, to uh, 
to offer our services. And so that's why there was a huge need for us to keep building in the main campus. Yeah, I agree. The need to build and expand, it was, it was necessary. Um, Red Mountain did all that it could for as long as it could, but we just outgrew it. Um, not only by, you know, the amount of students that were enrolling, but as Fred mentioned earlier, uh, the amount of faculty members that were in desperate need of office space. Um, it really allowed us to, to propel ourselves into a new, new era, really, um, for the college. Um, Fred, are you around? Is there anything you could add about um, that era of construction? Because it, it started happening shortly after you arrived. It sure did. It was exciting. It, Red Mountain was an interesting building back then, uh, probably still seen as a bit of an interesting building today. I, I quickly learned that in Nevada, we built buildings in phases and we referred to different portions of the Red, what we call the Red Mountain building today, uh, we're in different phases. Uh, when I arrived, phase three had been completed and that was also it was referenced as the annex. Uh, and, uh, and so after I understood the phasing, what was intriguing, it, to me, it was a wonder house. It was like the Winchester wonder house from the day I walked into Red Mountain. It was very easy to get, uh, get lost. Uh, many who have arrived on TMCC in the last several years, there was a project several years ago that finally completed hallways that went to nowhere. <laughs> uh, and, and so if you got lost, it, it could take a bit to figure your way out. Uh, we had affectionate areas like the hole. Uh, at the, if you took the main elevator uh, near uh, the student services on the third floor down all the way, uh, it was an amazing place. It was the only storage the campus had. And everything that you seemed to need was there, but it was, you opened the door and you were in the world of dirt and foundation of the building. But, uh, you know, we were, I was always amazed at how everybody improvised, made things work. I was very surprised to find fire trucks parked under the building. And, you know, we had the diesel yard, which is now the great space in, in the, the Danini building and the bookstore is what was the diesel building. And so, uh, I, I was happy that I got to know the campus the way it was so that I could so appreciate how it transformed itself as we as we move forward with this period of expansion. But as for the construction, you know, we had, I, I saw it as the road to nowhere. We had a road that went by uh, the Red Mountain building and it was is going to be the parking and everything for the new building. It was nice to see that completed. The you know, parking became far more convenient. Uh, and it just felt like the campus was growing up, uh, becoming far more uh, a comprehensive community college. Transfer was becoming a very popular enrollment. Uh, we had bus 17, which was a critical connection between UNR and TMCC. Bus 17 brought a lot of UNR students over to TMCC, made it convenient for them. And I know during the 90s, we had literally more than a thousand. At one point, we had more than 2,000 UNR students attending TMCC because we had found a way to make it convenient for them to do so. Uh, those were, I thought, the very positive days of NG, the very positive days of the relationship between UNR and TMCC. Uh, and uh, I dare say it, 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 made, it made a real difference. It really added to this, this culture of growth, both physically and in terms of our enrollments. Could I interrupt a second? John, yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry I've had so much trouble getting on. I've never had that before. Uh, anyhow, I just wanted to second what Fred said. I think it's uh, that period of time was an excellent period of time. In fact, we did a study and found that uh, in the early stages there, almost as many students were transferring from UNR to TMCC <laughs> as were transferring from TMCC to UNR. It was a really solid symbiotic relationship between the two institutions at that time. So I'm sorry about not showing you my picture. However, I think you can live without it. Uh, I, as the years have gone by, the ones you've been demonstrating are far superior to, to the present, okay? John, thank, thank you. Hey, um, I'd like to ask you too, um, you know, during this period of growth, um, you played a tremendous role in acquiring the building that I'm currently sitting in right now, uh, the library. Would you oh, be so okay. kind as to tell us a story um, 
a little bit maybe about your relationship with Bill Raggio and how you two managed to work this, this building into what it is. Well, thank you for the invitation to do that. Uh, first of all, uh, Bill Raggio, Senator Raggio, is probably, if not the best, one of the very best state politicians I've worked with in my career. He, and uh, Northern Nevada will never be represented as well as he did. Uh, and Joe Dini, who was Speaker of the House at the time, those two individuals were profoundly important to Northern Nevada and to TMCC. They, uh, the story goes rather simply, I was in the office one day and the phone rang and it didn't, didn't appear to be anybody else around. Answered the phone and when you answered the phone and Bill Raggio was on the other end, he rarely ever identified himself. He always just started talking. He assumed you knew who he was and you, you best know who he was at that time. Uh, he did indicate to me that, uh, that the legislature was considering sending all the capital funds south and that uh, he didn't want it to happen. And he wanted to know if I could bill something for a million dollars. And I said, no, sir, I don't have a single thing that I could bill for a million dollars. And then he proceeded to talk to me about what I needed. And we did transact back and forth. And finally, I gave him a figure that I had no idea how I got it. I just pulled it off the top of my head and said, uh, this is what we need to build a library. And uh, he said, thank you, and hung up. And I frankly forgot about it until the end of the session when TMCC got the library. So, uh, yeah. It, by the way, you know, at the time, it was a very, very fine facility. And the staff there have done a wonderful job taking care of the, the library. Thank you, John. Um, that was that was perfect. Um, I'd like to show real quick um, for those of you that don't know, um, the library is now connected to the Sierra Building. However, it wasn't always that way. Yeah. And here's some early construction photos. Um, so next time you come into the library, before you go in through the sliding doors, look up and you'll notice um, the big glass structure that was originally meant to be out facing out, walking outside. Um, so now mm -hmm. that's all that's all connected. The little, you know, we have the great, uh, I mean, the facilities is, and uh, capital planning has done a great job at completely re refurbishing this whole building just in the last few years. We have the great uh, new little coffee area out front. Um, but it's really incredible seeing these photos and then just trying to imagine that, yeah, at one point was its own standalone building. And then of course, shortly after Sierra building was completed. Um, but yeah, next time you you're in, uh, check it out and you'll, you'll really notice those features that you think, Hey, like this, this was at one point facing out into the, out into the parking lot there. Um, so could, really, I, could I add one, one yes. more quick point? When I came here, I, by the way, I came in 86, and uh, I, I, Jim Erdley was a nice person, and I enjoyed his company a lot when I, we had the opportunity. Uh, but he, there was a lot that he wanted to do that he just hadn't had time to, to accomplish. And so when I began to talk about a library, I got a phone call from, Senator Don Mello, and some of you might want to go back, well, probably won't want to go back, but you may remember Don Mello, he was in the Senate. By the way, there's a ballpark named after him in Sparks. And he called me and he said, uh, I want to talk to you about this library idea. And so he asked me to come to Carson City. And I went in, sat down, and he said to me, why do you need a library? And I said, well, sir, they're the center of knowledge in the campus and all that kind of thing. And he looked at me straight in the face and said, have your kids read all the books in the library you've got? And I didn't quite know how to answer him at that point. I said, you know, sir, my knowledge is that individuals uh, on campus never read all the books in the library. In fact, uh, and so on. And finally, he gave up and thought I was an idiot and went away. So, uh, Know. but we did get the library. I'm sorry, but that was an interesting moment in that battle. 
Thank you, John. I'm, I'm glad we got the library. <laughs> Cameron? Yes. If I could add to that, because- Yes, sir, please. As a political scientist uh, in, in meeting John Galtney, I was frankly amazed at his political acumen. Uh, this is someone who I think missed his calling and should have been in elective office, would have been, he would have been the, the uh, Harry Reid of his time. And I saw it play out all the time. You know, the aggressive building schedule that we had was a direct result of the relationships that he had built at the, in the state legislature, especially with who turned out to be the most prevalent person, uh, Bill Raggio, for 37 years in the state legislature. But when the library was built, I, I wish you could have had a shot that panned over to the other direction, because uh, way out at what is now the end of the Sierra building, there was this little brick building, this little cement building. And uh, that was the heating plant for the library. And uh, I've been told, I don't know that the story came from John, but that uh, Bill Raggio was brought up to see the great accomplishment of the library completed. And then asked, well, what's that, that little thing down there? And, he, and John, of course, the brilliant tactician that he has always been, pointed out that that was the, the HVAC system for the library and for the next building we needed, the Advanced Technology Center. And oh, by the way, it was being built large enough to support a biology building on the other side. Uh, that was the kind of you know, visioning that politicians react very positively to. They, uh, it, it just sort of sealed the deal, I think, in understanding that we had more expansion to do. John, you can deny the story if you wish. <laughs> no, it's pretty well true. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to move into another phase of what I'd like you all to speak about. Um, during that time, especially at late 80s into the early mid 90s, Technology absolutely exploded. Um, I remember it as a kid in, in school, you know, getting our first computers in our classrooms. Um, what was that like to be a part of that on campus, to really be immersed in that as it changed really rapidly, um, you know, through this time period? Okay, uh, in regards to technology, uh, let me go ahead and uh, paint a picture for you. Um, what registration was like in the 80s and what registration is like now. Uh, back in the 80s, I remember uh, in 1984, uh, taking a whole day off to register for classes. Uh, and, and what happened was you would go into this gym and there were different sections, uh, uh, tables where you have to register for English, math, science, whatever classes you choose. Uh, and it was a, a line uh, of people lined up to register for a specific class. And that would probably take anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes for each class that you register for. And then after going through all those lines, you would go to another line to pay for your classes, which would be another half hour or so. Uh, and then after paying for your classes, you would go ahead and buy the books. And then you're looking at another half hour of standing in line uh, to register for classes. That's how registration was before technology. Now you go into your computer, uh, you log into the computer in five minutes, you're, you're all set up and registered and paid and bought books and everything for classes. Amazing how technology changed. Well, and, and let me just add to that that after you waited for the 20 or 30 minutes online, if the class happened to fill up, that was the end. And then you had to have a second plan of what you were gonna put in that time slot. So you were there with that little card trying to figure out what else you could do to jockey that position. Thank you, Rosa. Yes, that's that's, 100% accurate. Um, I think technology has been, is, continues to be a driving force, but think about the last couple of years if we did not have technology that we have come to have. I don't know that the college could have survived those the last two years, but I'm thinking back even earlier, there's so many pieces of technology that we've become accustomed to that we use without thinking and just assume that it's always been there. I was surprised when Kathy Berry from, from Epic um, 
put together a timeline, a chronological listing of all of the things that took place over the last 50 years um, in the non-credit classes. And Cameron, I know you were a big help for her in doing that. And one of the things that I found most fascinating when we talk about lack of technology was that TMCC in the first decade did not use credit cards. We did not use a credit card until 1981. And I, I found that so hard to believe because it's such an automatic part of our life now. And it's come so far that I think even credit cards probably will be disappearing and there'll be new technology that will gradually make that outdated. But we, there are so many pieces of it that we take for granted. Everybody has a PC on their desk these days. Back in the early 80s, we had things called terminals where if you had one in the office, you could run an enrollment report so that you knew what the enrollments were in various classes, which was a huge help. Um, we had word processing labs, not computer labs, but word processing labs um, so that students could go in and you know type a term paper. As far as um, anything beyond that, it was pretty scarce. And, but we made good use of those pieces of equipment and we're happy to have them. I mean, we had come from the 70s where we had typewriters and if we were really lucky, you had a correcting typewriter and now you had a word processor. So that was pretty exciting. I think a lot of the opportunities that we had um, to continue to develop technologically and also with regards to buildings and services that we provided had to do with John's ability to get that Title III grant and the follow-up grant that was matching. I think that opened so many doors for us, um, not just in, in faculty and staff and services, but in technology that we could explore to. So um, thank you, John, for making that. Well, thank you, Pat, for the kind words. I think the statute of limitations has expired for some of the things it took to get those two grants. But, uh, and I was reminiscing about that, uh, and maybe that's something we could cover a little later in our talk. Um, Fred. Anything you'd like to add about tech and how it's impacted, you know, your career or, you know, your, your relationship with your students? Well, I was impressed in 1991 when I got into my office that I had a computer sitting on my desk. I, I think uh, leadership at that point in time, realizing how rapidly changing technology was, the importance, growing importance it had in curriculum by the early 1990s. At the university I'd been at, uh, we had been more at the sort of the sort of subcomputer level. They were talking about finally getting computers on desks when I left, but they were already here at, at TMCC. Uh, the biggest early argument on campus with faculty and staff was between Microsoft and Corel. Uh, that was an ugly argument. <laughs> and uh, those who were arguing for Corel were very unhappy that they lost that argument. Uh, our move on to the internet and establishing an email system was extremely early uh, in the cycle of technology. So again, we were kind of a cutting edge institution. Uh, TMCC offered its first online class in 1995-96 with Leon Lucchese, who basically taught an electronics class to British Columbia. Um, I don't know how many people at the time realized he was doing it. He did it over a dial-up modem, but he did it and, um, and was, was quick to demonstrate the technology that was going on there. We, uh, we had our first LCD projector on campus in 1997 or 98, brought by, you know, on, on board by a, a VP who had seen this technology at a conference. Nursing led the technology move into the classroom with uh, the, uh, the document cameras, the ELMOs. Uh, they said that there was going to be a critical piece in, in their instruction in the classroom. And through the 1990s, they were the, the ones that were pushing for, for more technology in the classrooms. Uh, in the campus responded. Uh, we ultimately established a tech fee that helped to underwrite that. 
uh, you know, computer labs became far more sophisticated and more numerous. Uh, the use of technology and instruction became easier to do. Uh, you know, we were very early on in Wi-Fi. A, a trivial thing that probably nobody knows, but TMCC was the first community college in America to receive its own domain name, tmcc.edu. As John would suggest, there, there are some interesting behind the scenes stories that we probably still can't legally share, but uh, th there's a great story as to how we got that. Uh, and so I think that technology has always, always been important for us. Uh, the move to online uh, by 1999 uh, uh, was uh, possibly one of the, the first, if not the first of the NG institutions to do that. Uh, we did have an interactive video system in place, but as an urban provider, interactive video was just not the best idea for us. Uh, it became video conferencing and it still serves that purpose today. But it was important. It, I think it, uh, as faculty dealing with the transformation of the economy, the ability to use technology, to demonstrate the use of technology, to demonstrate the importance of technology was critical in our role of preparing our students for the changing economy. Thank you, Fred. Um, you know, we're getting, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, there is one thing I, I'd like to kind of backtrack um, and ask Dr. Galtney about, um, and everyone else as well. Um, in 1987, um, TMCC obtained a grant. It was called the Title III grant, which was um, at the time $2.5 million. Um, Dr. Galtney, could, I mean, this, this led to, I, I feel, a lot of the growth that we then experienced over the next several years. Um, Dr. Galtney, could you touch on that just for, for a few minutes and tell us the significance of that and um, kind of the ins and outs of how you, how you got that, how, how, how it happened? The history of that is fairly complicated. And as uh, Fred has suggested, some of it uh, relies on the idea that the statute of limitations has expired for uh, how it was obtained in some cases very quickly. I had a working relationship with Title III before coming to Nevada. I had received a Title III in Kansas and I knew some of the personnel. In a very short uh, synopsis, Title III was going to be eliminated by Congress when a consortium was put together by myself, the president of uh, Orange County in Florida, uh, the president of Gillette, Wyoming, and one other, I can't remember, who met with the uh, Secretary Cavanaugh's uh, and helped by pulling our senators together to get the Title III funded. So Title III uh, was somewhat beholding to the four of us who had put the money in the pocket. When we got here, uh, I was particularly impressed with the young Senator Reed, who was a part of uh, the legislative group in DC. When Pat and the other staff, uh, Jimmy, I, I believe Jimmy was the one who went to DC with me. And I sat down with Harry Reid and, and I was amazed that he gave me about 45 minutes and we went through the grant. And then later I heard from the head of the department of Title III that Harry Reid had actually called her and walked her through the grant. He had her get it out, he explained it to her and we got the two plus million dollars. However, the, the final round was a little bit more of uh, chicanery, I guess. The fact is that we really wanted the foundation saved. And so I was looking for a way to, uh, to maybe grease the process a little. And so uh, I asked the head of Title III what she would like to have from Nevada. And she said, I would love to have a slot machine, but we have a law that you can only take a gift up to $8 in value. And so I went to Harris and I asked Harris, by the way, I just had lunch with the fellow that ran Harris Warehouse and they said they had some slot machines, old fashioned ones, the chrome ones, dime slot machines. And I said to Ron, who was the head of uh, Harris at the time, I'd like you to help the college by having a, a lottery for one of those slot machines. And you're gonna get sell five tickets 
and I'm going to buy all five tickets, and I'm going to win the slot machine. Then you're going to help me box it up and send it to D.C. And with a copy of the letter you sent me that I won, and my $1 ticket uh, had just purchased a slot machine. Strangely enough, we ended up with the uh, $1.7 million. Sometimes it helps to find out what uh, really makes people tick. And uh, by the way, she's a marvelous person. In fact, uh, a couple of years later, my family and I went to DC and we spent time with her. Uh, and just a really nice uh, person. And all that put together really got the, the, the uh, technology rolling and it, it had saved the foundation. Mark Dawson, who was the chancellor uh, during that period of time, had advised me twice in the budget cycle to eliminate the foundation from the budget request. And I kept saying, no, we can save it. Uh, we just need to figure out a way to give it a, a real push in the start. So uh, please don't repeat that. Help me keep the secret, okay? That is such a great story. And I, I think I should point out because really what you did in getting that grant was so incredible. My recollection is that I heard that it was the largest Title III grant at that point to ever have been awarded to a community college. So That's correct. I think that you deserve kudos from now until whatever for and the changes that it made to the to the college and moving forward. Well, thank you, Pat. I, uh, but you and Jimmy and a number of others did the writing of the grant, did an awful lot of work. And you did it, uh, I appreciate the fact on my suggestion that we had a chance getting it. The college up to that time had not really paid much attention to federal projects of that type. And there wasn't a whole lot of faith that we could get the project. So it was important at the time to make sure we did obtain it so that people would look outside for other kinds of funding. Uh, there were wonderful stories about people in the community who stepped up to match the funds that were coming in for the, uh, for the foundation. Uh, one elderly couple at a little fundraiser we had came to me and said, we're gonna give you some money. And I looked at his uh, polyester coat and thought, mm, maybe $2,000, that type thing. Well, a week later, I opened the letter and they had donated $73,000 to the foundation. So there are wonderful stories. Uh, Cashman Caterpillar who donated a sizable amount and so on uh, in helping out that process. Thank you, John. Um, that's fantastic. Um, you know, one last thing I'd like to ask everyone, because um, I'd like to save time for questions and comments in case anyone has any. Um, each of our four panelists, um, just in your opinion, and, and some of this might be repeating what we've already spoken about, um, of all the changes that happened during these times, um, in your opinion, which one has had the most lasting impact on the college um, and why? Um, Umberto, could you start, please? Um, you know, of all through all the years I worked at TMCC, it's um, I don't think I would have I would be the person that I am today. I, I, I it it made me the person that uh, uh, happy. I mean, it's just working with with uh, with uh, staff and 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 students. And and seeing everyone succeed, it just uh, it just kind of makes you uh, feel like you accomplish something in your life. It's just it's just so rewarding uh, that I am so grateful forever for that experience. I think that's great. Thank you, uh, Pat. Berta, that was so nicely said. Uh, and I when I think of the impact that things in the 80s and 90s had on current um, 
environment, technology does immediately come to mind just because it's so constantly changing and growing and allowing us to do different things. But among all the changes that we've seen and among all of the growth and there's still something that we've hung on to that has not changed. And I think Umberto has touched upon that. Um, we still react and move forward based on the simple philosophy that we had in 1971 that we still have today. And that is what can we do for students? How can we make this better for students? So as much as we change and grow, we are allowed to do that because we've kept that strong foundation. And like Umberto, I feel very proud to have been a part of that history. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Fred, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, as I say, I came late to the community college movement, but I think the greatest gift, leadership, the right people at the right time. I mean, the sense of community, the sense of shared vision of what we were about and the difference that we were making in the lives of our students was so present in 1991 when I came. Um, I honestly did, didn't become part of a college, it became part of a family. Uh, sometimes a rather quirky family, I'd be the first to admit, but it was, it was just amazing. The, the, the excuses that we found to, to get together, the, the connections, the, the friendships uh, that, that drove our relationships, especially in the 90s, uh, was so deeply appreciated. It was such a change from the university life that I had had. But for me, the, in a state that has little or no choice in higher education, the community colleges were sort of whimsically created, but have, have made such a difference, you know, with doors wide open saying that everyone has a chance to you know, try to succeed in, in education and change their lives and make, make their lives better. That has been our mission, as, as Pat points out, since 1971, and we've done a damn good job of it. Uh, and I think that you know, that is perhaps uh, Dr. Galtney's greatest legacy for us was to foster an environment that made us so successful at making a difference in the lives of so many. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. And Dr. Galney, um, give you the last word here. Anything you'd like to add? Well, I would like to tell you one more story uh, that I probably uh, consider the, personally the most significant thing that I did while I was there. When I uh, took the job uh, at TMCC, there were some things that bothered me. And one of them was that if you were a teacher at TMCC, the best title you could have was instructor. And so Paul Meacham, who was then president of the school in Clark County, and I sat down at dinner one night and we said, you know, this is just not fair. We ought to figure out a way to, to uh, honor the appropriate teachers and so on at, at the community colleges. So a long battle ensued, uh, almost a pitch battle with the universities at that point. Because the university said community college teachers are not entitled to be professors because they don't do research. And I, I think Paul and I, and Paul passed away a while back. I would give him a lot of credit. He probably had more marbles in the game than I did. But we fought this issue for almost a year. And uh, it really almost came to blows in Bob Maxson's conference room in Las Vegas one afternoon, when the two vice presidents from the universities came in and to tell us that community college people just couldn't be. By the way, the lowest faculty rating at the university was be an instructor. And the highest one you could be at the community college was an instructor. And I found that something that made me angry just talking about it. And I recall, uh, Mark Dawson reaching across and grabbing me the arm when I decided I was going to go across the table and smack one of the vice presidents. And so it got very, very nasty in that discussion. And so when Dorothy Gallagher finally took the lead on the board and said she would fight this issue for Paul and I, 
we didn't get all that we wanted because the title that was accepted was community college professor. But we changed that, and Paul and I both thought that was one of the best things that we did. Uh, it was uh, one of those things that probably didn't mean anything to anybody at dollar wise. It didn't change the teaching, but I think it changed the issue of what community colleges do and how they do it. Uh, so I guess uh, if I look back on the things that that I uh, think probably go almost unnoticed, that's something that I take a lot of pride in. Thank you, John. That's a that's a great way to end end our presentation, at least. Um, before we officially um, end this, um, are there any questions or comments that anyone has um, for any of our panelists? Feel free to either um, you could type it in the chat or go ahead and speak up on here. Um, anything is anything's open. Cameron, there is one question in chat uh, from Frank. With growth of the internet, Wi-Fi, et cetera, how did TMCC protect the privacy of students and employees info? Um, was it a challenge at the time? You know, I mean, I would say it, at the beginning, it probably was a challenge. Um, I don't know if Cal Anderson's in here, but he'd be a he'd be someone that could definitely uh, speak on that, Frank. Uh, but it's a great question. Um, absolutely. I would offer that, and I think Humberto would agree. We had, and I've had, always had, an excellent IT. Uh, we took it seriously before anybody knew you should take it seriously, uh, and so we were eyes at the state of the art expectations for for security. Also, it was a simpler time. Uh, we weren't being, you know, constantly hacked and pinged for such things. Uh, it has become more of a problem over time. Uh, at that time, it, there, there was a, a certain blessed insularity that came with being on the internet. Thank you, Fred. Well, um, you know, before we wrap it up, I'd like to uh, say a great thank you again to Dr. Galtney, Pat Slavin, Humberto Hernandez and Fred Locken for generously um, allowing us to, you know, you know, get these stories from you. I mean, it's it's really been great, um, and it it's it's such a treat to have these firsthand accounts from those of you that were here during that time. Um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Well, thank you for doing this. I. Uh... I really appreciate the fact that some of those stories are being preserved for the future. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Kate, is there anything that you would like to add? Um, any, any information, any, anything? No more information, just a sincere thanks to our panelists and to you, Cameron, for doing a great job moderating. We appreciate you stepping in. Thank thanks. you everyone for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye-bye.